To others, Laura was dead. To others, it was Laura who had been buried beneath the marble cross in Limeridge churchyard. She was dead to her uncle, dead to those who knew her save her sister Marion and me. She was dead in the eye of the law, and as a result her fortune had been given to her husband and to her aunt. She was dead. How therefore could she ever be Laura again? The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins Dramatised for radio by Martin Wade With Juliet Aubrey as Marion Halcombe Emily Bruni as Laura Fairley Toby Stevens as Walter Hartwright Philip Voss as Count Fosco Jeremy Clyde as Sir Percival and Edward Petherbridge as Mr Fairley Episode 4 We took the London train from Limeridge. Laura sat by my side. Her poor, innocent head lay trustingly on my shoulder. She is asleep, I think. Yes. The day's excitement has worn her out. Tell me, Marion, how much does she remember of what has happened to her? Very little as yet. She knows that she left Blackwater Park and went by train to London and was met at the station by Count Fosco. And she was taken to a house and became very frightened. After that, she remembers nothing until the moment when she woke up in a small, brown-tiled room. She had been drugged, one assumes, and taken to the asylum. Yes. And the dress that she was wearing was not her own. It was a white dress. It was Anne Catherick's. It was. Laura had become the woman in white. And the woman in white, she had died. And under Laura's name was laid to rest at Limeridge, reunited with her beloved Mrs. Fairley. Extraordinary. Almost beyond belief. But the process of exchanging the two identities released Laura's money without the need to kill her, and at the same time preserved Sir Percival's secret. It was a brilliant plot, devised, no doubt, by Count Fosco. If I am to search for Anne Catherick, I must know how to recognise the woman. Well, it's very easy to describe her. She bears a remarkable resemblance to Lady Glyde. <laughs> well, 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 well. But, Marion, you yourself must have believed that Laura was dead. Uh, uh, how was it you found her? It was Anne Catherick I was looking for, of course, not Laura. I was hoping to discover Sir Percival's secret from her. Count Fosco had already written to my uncle stating that Anne Catherick had been found and had been put into the same asylum from which she had previously escaped and warning that she might use her resemblance to Laura to claim Laura's identity. So I found the asylum and secured a meeting with the patient in the asylum grounds. She was pointed out to me by a nurse. She was walking in my direction. I saw her face. So like Laura's, I thought. So very much like hers. She caught sight of me. She stopped, amazed. Marion! She rushed towards me. Marion! Laura, Laura, it's you, alive! Dearest sister! Oh, dearest sister! <gasps> the three of us took humble lodgings above a news vendor's shop in East London. I earned some money from illustrations for various cheap periodicals, but we were very poor for I had no savings, and all that Marion possessed had been handed to the nurse who was in charge of Laura to secure her release from the asylum. Worse than the poverty, though, was the condition into which my dearest Laura had sunk. Her mind, her spirit, they had been dealt a crushing blow. I'd like to show you a drawing, Laura. Do you remember that place at all? Yes, yes, I remember it. The summer house. The garden at Limeridge. That's right. And who did the drawing? And then gave it to me as a present, a perfect present. It was me. It was. And I must tell you, your drawing has never been separated from me since. Now look, I have a little present for you. A sketchbook? 
It is very like the one you had when I first met you. Do you wish me to draw in it? Yes, if you wish. I'm not sure I can. What skill I had to make that drawing of the summer house, I think I have forgotten. It will return, dearest Laura. It will all return. Your lost life, your lost happiness. One day again you will be Laura, just as I remember you. Her mind was clouded. Her beauty was faded. On account of her suffering, indeed, her looks bore a greater resemblance to Anne Catherick than to the Laura of old. I was determined, however, to restore her to health and to restore her also to her true identity, redress the wrong that had been done to her. To this end, I decided first that I would pay another call on Mr. Gilmore, the Fairley family's solicitor. Sadly, Mr. Hartwright, you haven't a glimmer of a case. You put it very strongly. I would dearly wish to believe what you've told me. Despite myself, I almost think I do. But as a solicitor, I must advise you that the evidence of Laura's death is all too plain. There is the statement which the Count gave to Mr. Fairley. There is the testimony of the doctor who attended the dying woman and the death certificate that he provided. Well, yes. There is the fact that when Laura was taken to the asylum, let us call her Laura for argument's sake, she was received as Anne Catholic without question. There is the fact that in order to obtain her release, Miss Halcombe decided not to take the proper formal steps, but bribed a nurse. And you and Miss Halcombe have now hidden the fugitive in London. What else could we have done? We are in fear for our safety. Mr. Hartwright, please. I am simply stating the position from a legal point of view. When Miss Halcombe presented Laura at Limeridge House, her own uncle failed to recognise her. The servants likewise. She is much changed. Her imprisonment in the asylum... Of course I understand. But I'm afraid that as things are, you and Miss Halcombe are to be regarded as either foolish dupes or scheming accomplices. To be truthful, Mr. Hartwright, you haven't much hope. Your only chance, perhaps... Yes? Your only chance would be if there was some discrepancy in the dating of events. If the death certificate, I mean, showed a date that was earlier than Laura's journey from Blackwater Park to London. Yes, I'd already thought of that. But unfortunately, the date of the journey isn't certain. Laura can't remember it, nor, says Marion, can the housekeeper at Blackwater Park. Count Fosco and Sir Percival Glyde will know it, perhaps. But if you are right, you can't expect any help from that quarter. They may be forced to help, and indeed to answer for their crime. Oh, yes? Forced by who? By me. You are very determined, Mr. Hartwright. One last thing. Do you happen to know if Sir Percival Glyde is still abroad? I do. He is not. I was speaking to his solicitor only yesterday. Sir Percival has been in Paris, but is now returned. Indeed. Well, Mr. Gilmore, I am much obliged to you. Mr. Hartwright, I wish I could do more. Oh, this letter came by post a day or two ago. For Miss Halcom. Perhaps you could deliver it for me. Walter! You were so late. Yes, I'm sorry. I came a long way home. I was being followed. Oh, no. I fear so. But I think, I hope, that I lost him at last. He was one of Sir Percival Glyde's men. I'm certain of it. Gilmore informed me that Sir Percival is back in England. Walter. He has heard, no doubt, of Laura's escape from the asylum and is very anxious to find us. We are in danger, then. We are. Grave danger. So tell me, what advice did Mr. Gilmore offer us? (sighs) precious little. Our only hope, he says, lies in proving that Laura was still alive after the date shown on the death certificate. Oh, a letter for you. Do you recognise the hand? Yes. Yes, I do. It's Count Fosco's. Dear and admirable woman, I urge you, dwell in the Valley of Tranquility and let the storms of life pass over you. If you have rash friends, encourage them not to threaten the interests of Count Fosco, lest he become a man of action. Let no one cross my path, Miss Halcombe. I will show no mercy. 
He's trying hard to frighten us. A sign, perhaps, that he is a little frightened himself. So, we should frighten him still more if we can. And Sir Percival, too. The proof that Laura didn't die. The proof that we must show the world. I'll get it from them somehow. You begin with the Count. For my sake, Walter, pursue him first. But for Laura's sake, I must begin where there is the best chance of success. Oh, yes, yeah. yes, of course. The Count has no palpable weakness. Sir Percival, however, does. His secret? Yes! When Sir Percival agreed to the plot against Laura, it wasn't merely money that drove him. He thought, still thinks, that Laura knows enough to ruin him, that she was told it by Anne Catherick. Marion, my old superstition still clings to me. Though the poor creature is dead in her grave, the woman in white shows the way to the appointed end. My mind went back to that first meeting with Anne Catherick. I have a friend in London. She lives in Guildford Street. Promise you won't stop me from seeing her. Guildford Street, where Mrs. Clements, her faithful protectress, was living. I resolved to begin my search for the secret there. I blame myself for her disappearance. You mustn't do that, Mrs. Clements. Oh, but I do. We were in Hampshire. We were staying near Blackwater Park and... I met a foreign gentleman. A count he was. By this time, Anne was quite ill. She had a heart condition, I think. That's right. It seemed to come on after she heard that the day of the wedding was fixed. Between Sir Percival Glyde, you know, and... Um... Uh, yes, yes, I know. And when I told the count about Anne's illness, he gave her a medicine, which made her feel stronger. He was most kind. And Anne had something very important to tell Lady Glyde. But the Count said that the lady had gone up to London and that we should do the same and meet her there. So we went up and Anne stayed with me for a few days. And then the wife of the foreign gentleman called for Anne to take her to Lady Glyde. And they went away in a cab. I haven't seen her since. Mrs. Clements, I cannot help you find her. Indeed, you should not hope that she will ever be traced. Oh. Oh, no. But you can help me, Mrs. Clements, by giving me the information that I seek about Anne and her family. You have known her, I believe, since her childhood. Oh, I nursed her from a baby, sir. The first time she said, Mother, she said it to me. <gasps> Well, perhaps you can tell me about her actual mother, Mrs. Catherick. Were you a neighbour of hers? Oh, yes, sir. At Wilmingham. Which is some 25 miles from Blackwater Park, I believe. Oh, that is right, sir. It was her husband who brought her to the town when he became parish clerk. Before that, she'd been in service at Varneck Hall near Southampton, which was owned by a friend of Mr. Philip Fairley. The same Fairley who was Lady Glyde's father? Yes, but that's by the way. Mrs. Catherick... She held herself uncommonly high, she did. Thought she was far too good for her husband. <laughs> well, I don't like to speak ill of anyone, sir, but she is a heartless woman, with a terrible will of her own. And she's not a stranger to scandal, either. Scandal? Mm, yes, sir. There was another man, a gentleman, so-called. His name? Sir Percival Glyde. Did the husband ever find out about his wife's relationship with Sir Percival? Oh, yes. Well, he'd suspected already because he discovered various gifts she'd had from Sir Percival. But then he came upon the two of them near the vestry of the church and they were whispering together. The men came to blows and Sir Percival was the stronger and beat the husband in the cruelest manner. And that same night, the husband left the town and was never seen in Wilmingham again. And Sir Percival? Oh, the place was too hot to hold him. He left soon after. But Mrs. Catherick, despite the scandal, she stayed on. She did. The brazen hussy. She told everyone she was the victim of a dreadful mistake, that she wasn't a guilty woman, and that she wouldn't be driven out. You haven't yet explained how it was that Anne was trusted to your care. Very simple, sir. Mrs. Catherick seemed to hate the helpless little creature from the day it was born, and there seemed to be nobody else to look after her. But when Anne was ten or eleven, 
Mrs. Catherick took her away from me. Took her to Limeridge. Ah, uh, yes, because Mrs. Catherick's sister was there and was dying. Mrs. Catherick went to nurse her. Well, she thought her sister had some money. That was her only reason. And after that, Mrs. Catherick wouldn't let Anne stay with me. She liked to distress us by keeping us apart. I moved to London, and I wrote to Anne from time to time, told her that if ever she was in trouble, she should come and see me. Which she did, after she escaped from the asylum. Yes. Oh, poor Anne. My initial inference, of course, was that Sir Percival's secret must be connected with Mrs. Catherick's disgrace. But from what you say, the disgrace wasn't a secret at all. Not in Welmingham, at least. Exactly, Marion. And it seems Sir Percival made no attempt to take Mrs. Catherick away from the town. It's as if he were happy for her to stay there. Yes. So perhaps Mrs. Catherick was speaking the truth when she said there had been a dreadful mistake. Perhaps Sir Percival even encouraged the notion of Mrs. Catherick's disgrace to divert from himself some other suspicion. Mm. So when he and Mrs. Catherick had their encounters, they weren't pursuing a liaison at all. Not an amorous one, at least. They were meeting for another purpose. What purpose, though? Well, I must pay a call on Mrs. Catherick, must I not? And do my best to find out. Morning came. I packed a bag for the journey to Wilmingham and sat down to speak to my poor, dearest Laura. You are going away? For how long? Not long, I think. And when I return, I can give you more lessons in your drawing. You are not tired of me, I hope. You are not going away because you are tired of me. Uh, no, Laura. I'll try to get better, I promise. I'll try not to be so pale and weak and useless. Uh, I'm such a burden at present. Laura. You will start liking Marion more than me. My dearest. You will, you... because I'm so helpless. Laura. Listen to me. One day you will be well again. I know you will. But whether you are well or not, I love you. I love you as much as I have ever done, and I will love you forever more. Remember that. Please, my dearest. I arrived at Wilmingham early in the afternoon. I walked through its prim, torpid streets and found Mrs. Catherick's house in an arid square set around a bare plot of grass. Mrs. Clements had given me a discouraging impression of Mrs. Catherick, so it was with little optimism that I knocked upon the door of number 13 and was shown into a little room with big patterned wallpaper and cheap furniture. You have come, my maid tells me, to speak about my daughter. Yes. I am afraid that she is dead. Ah, is she? Well, then I suppose I shall have to go into mourning, as you see there is not much alteration required in my attire. I should also inform you, Mrs. Catherick, that your daughter's death has been used as an opportunity for inflicting grave harm upon a person who is dear to me. There are two men involved in this wrongdoing. The name of one of them is Sir Percival Glyde. Indeed. Mrs. Catherick, I am determined to bring Sir Percival to account, and in order to do so, I must obtain some information about events which occurred before your daughter was born, when your husband was the clerk of the parish. Oh, I understand. You have a grudge against Sir Percival, and I must help you take your revenge on him, because you think I am a fallen woman who will do anything you ask for fear you may injure me in the town's estimation. You say that I have a grudge against Sir Percival. But you have a grudge, too. Do I? I'm certain of it. Mrs. Catherick, you can help me ruin him. You can help me crush him. I've no wish to help you. Do you not trust me? No. Are you afraid? Of you. No, of Sir Percival. He's a man of some power and influence. Oh, yes. He possesses a fine estate, is descended from a great family. A great family, indeed. Especially on his mother's side. Well, I know nothing about Sir Percival's mother. I imagine that you know very little about Sir Percival. I know a few things, and I suspect many more. Mrs. Catherick, you remember that day when you and Sir Percival were discovered by your husband? You and he had met by the vestry of Welmingham Church. No, 
You will not ask me about that. Whatever it was that brought you together, it was not a bond of guilty love. Was it, Mrs Catherick? Get out of my house. I am right, am I not? Leave now. My reference to the church vestry had been little more than casual, but Mrs Catherick's response persuaded me that Sir Percival's secret must be associated with that place. Also, her snide remark about Sir Percival's mother opened a line of thought about Sir Percival's parentage, which could well have some connection. If there were a marriage register in the vestry of Welmingham Church, might the secret perhaps lie there? Two men, look, beyond the churchyard wall. I think I recognize one of them. He followed me when I was in London. Yes, but I wasn't followed from Mrs. Catherick's. These men have been waiting for me. So, my suspicions about the vestry were correct. Sir Percival was afraid that my investigations might lead me to the church, and he's got his men here in advance. Ah, and here's another fellow. If you wish to go inside, sir... Uh, yes, I do. Then I can help you. I'm the parish clerk, sir. Excellent. It's parish records that I wish to see. They are kept in the vestry, I take it? Yeah, they are, sir. Come with me. Mm. Where are you from, sir? London? Yes. Uh, now, this lock is a very perverse lock. Mm. Oh, it ought to have been changed, as I've said to the church warden, 50 times at least. For you see, nothing gets done round here. Not like London. <laughs> ah, there we are. You'll uh, have to excuse the mess, sir. Very, very old, all these bits of wood. <laughs> old and as brick as crockery. They're meant to be sent away to be mended, but as I say, uh, nothing gets done round here. Uh, so? You'd like to look at a register? A marriage register. Ah, right. Now, what year was it you want, sir? Uh, let me think. Uh, 1804, and then working backwards. 1804. I hope you'll excuse me for saying so, but... Uh... That cupboard doesn't seem a very secure place for such important books. Shouldn't they be kept in a safe? Well, bless me, sir. But those are the very words my old master, Mr Wandsborough, used to say. A solicitor he was, and, uh, and vestry clerk, too. Vestry clerk? Yes, sir. The vestry clerk deals specifically with business relating to the vestry. Fancy you living in London not knowing that. <laughs> Here. Register of marriages, 1800 to 1810. And uh, these are the entries for December 1804. Thank you. December, November... So, as I was saying about Mr Wandsborough, if fearful as he was that a register might get stolen or destroyed, he made copies of the registers here and mm. kept them in his office in Knowlesbury. Of course, he's long gone, but his son's in the same line and in the same office. It was young Mr Wandsborough who got me the position after the previous parish clerk left in a hurry. Catherick, his name was. Yes, I've heard about him. December 1803. November... Will you be a while, sir? Uh, I hope not. October... September... What is the name you're looking for? Glide. G-L-Y... Ah! Ah, got it! Got it! Here, look! Sir Felix Glide. And the bride's name... Cecilia Jane Elster of Knowlesbury. Where young Mr. Wandsborough is. What? Oh, oh, yes, yes. The uh, writing's very small, sir, is it not? It is. The details have been compressed rather awkwardly at the bottom of the page. And there isn't the same sureness of hand. You know, there is cause here for a little suspicion. I decided I would walk to Knowlesbury. The distance, said the clerk, was not quite five miles, and pay a visit to Mr. Wandsborough's office. The two men were still waiting when I left the church, but they followed me a short distance only. By early afternoon, I had reached my destination. 1803, you said? That's right, uh, September. And the names? Glyde and Elster. Uh, Glyde. Are you certain it was September, sir? Quite certain. There's no such entry here. The truth was clear enough. Sir Percival had made a fraudulent entry to the vestry register, and he had done so in order to conceal his illegitimacy, to suppress the fact that he was not truly Sir Percival Glyde. 
I commenced the walk back to Welmingham, my head full of Sir Percival's secret. His secret is now mine too. One word from me and he loses everything, becomes a nameless, penniless, friendless outcast. Of course, he can't yet know whether I've discovered the secret, but he surely must fear that I'm getting close. Therefore, therefore there's nothing he won't attempt against me. To protect himself, he'd have me killed if he could. In the gloom, two shapes, two men. Evening to you. Not a pleasant one. Do I go back? Attempt to run past them? <laughs> Very well then. I'll stay and fight. <laughs> <laughs> Get him! Get him! They kept up the pursuit, but I took a turn down a footpath and across the fields, and I lost them. I discovered a lane, and after following its muddy windings, I at last found myself in Welmingham once more, in front of some cottages on the other side of the church. Sir, wait there. Yes, you, sir. From one of the cottages, a man with a lantern came hurrying towards me, the parish clerk. Where are the keys? Where are they? They were hanging up in my kitchen. Have you taken them? No, I have not. You mean the keys to the church, do you? Yes. Give me the lantern, quick. It must have been that young man, then. Or his master. His master? They were here about an hour ago. Sir Percival, the young man called him. Lord, save us. Look at the skylight. My God. The vestry's on fire. You better go back. Get whatever help you can. Yes. Yes. Lord, save us. Fire. Fire! Help me! Help me! You've locked the door! Yes, I, I can't turn the key for it move! Oh, get me out, please! Get me out! The lock may be broken. You're a dead man if you wasted another moment on it. What about the door into the church? No, it's impossible! The flames are too fierce! Well then, get down on the floor! I'll try and climb it through the skylight. Oh, for God's sake, be quick. For God's sake, hide it. I must say, I'm very surprised that you chose to risk your life for him when you had claimed to be his enemy. That was weakness on your part, I think. <laughs> As it is, I owe you a debt of gratitude. You owe me nothing, Mrs Catherine. No, no. Your presence in Welmingham, your inquiries, they frightened Sir Percival. Because of you, he decided to try and hide his crime and remove the register from the vestry. You, Mr Hartwright, you drove him to his death. Death. And because he was an ill-tempered, cruel, foul-mouthed, insolent man, I must thank you for what you've done. Mrs. Catherine... Was the fire, do you suppose, an accident? I think it was. There was a large amount of old wood stored in the vestry, and it would have caught a light very fast. But what was needed was for a lantern to overturn. But Sir Percival's fatal error lay in the fact that he locked the door behind him to ensure that he wouldn't be disturbed. The lock, I'm afraid, was faulty... Mrs. Catherick, I have one or two unanswered questions still. If, as you say, you wish to do me a favour, then all you need do is satisfy my curiosity. Sir Percival's parents, for instance, why did they never marry? The mother was married already. So the couple lived together as man and wife, and no one in the area supposed them to be anything else. What happened when the father died? Well, there was no difficulty at first... Sir Percival took possession of the title and the property, and his right to do so wasn't challenged. But he discovered that in order to borrow money on the property, he must have proof of his parents' marriage. So he hit upon the idea of forging an entry in a marriage register in a parish near to where his mother had lived. And he made the acquaintance of the parish clerk's wife and gave her gifts. And in return... I obtained the keys to the church vestry. Did he volunteer his reasons for wanting them? No, but I persuaded it out of him. What happened after your husband left you? Did Sir Percival assist you at all? Oh, yes. I've been receiving a yearly allowance from him ever since. You'll be sorry to lose that. I've saved enough in the last 20 years. I'll be comfortable, thank you. 
I assume there was a condition attached to the allowance. You had to keep silent about Sir Percival's secret. Yes. Also, I had to stay in Welmingham, so that he would always know where to find me, though he would let me go to Limeridge when my sister was dying. Anne claimed she knew the secret. No, she never knew it. She knew that there was such a secret and that it could ruin him. I had revealed as much one day in her presence when I had read a letter from Sir Percival and had found it insulting and angrily blurted something out. And the next time Sir Percival came to the house, Anne, in turn, was angered by him because he called her an idiot. So she threatened him by repeating what she'd heard from me. That sealed her fate. She was soon in an asylum. Yes. Not a pauper's asylum, a private establishment. I insisted on that. One final question concerning Anne's father. Anne bore a striking resemblance to Sir Percival's wife, Lady Glyde, and it seems to me that the resemblance cannot be put down to mere chance. I have discovered, Mrs. Catherick, that you were in service before you came to Welmingham, at a place called Varnock Hall, whose owner was a friend of Mr. Philip Fairley, Lady Glyde's father. Is it possible, I wonder, that while you were in service at Varnock Hall, Mr. Fairley came to stay there for a while. Well, Mrs. Catherick? It's possible. You were, as you said yourself, a handsome young woman. No doubt Mr. Philip Fairley found you so. Well, Mrs. Catherick? Count Fosco. Yes, dear lady. It is I. How delightful to see you again. What are you doing here? A matter of business. I shall not detain you long. I have a cab waiting, just there. A gentleman is seated inside. Do you recognize him, dearest lady, from your visit to the asylum? He is the owner of that place, and I am assisting him in his search for a missing patient. How is the patient? And how are you? Go away, please. Leave me. You deceive my letter, I trust. I suggested in the letter, you will recall, that I would be happy to lie quiet, provided that my interests were not threatened, provided my personal freedom and the money my dear wife inherited remained secure. Well, it seems now that my interests may be threatened. Why? Sir Percival is dead. Dead? Oh, yes. And in consequence, no doubt, your friend Mr. Hartwright will begin considering ways of striking at me. Advise him against such a course of action, please. Advise him in the strongest possible terms. He cannot succeed. Well, I must return to the carriage. And what will you tell the gentleman who is waiting there? For your sake, Marion, because of my esteem for you, because I cannot bear to think of you experiencing anguish, I will tell him that I made an error that the patient is not to be found at this address. Remember this sacrifice of mine, dearest Marion. In return for my act of clemency, persuade Mr. Hartwright to interfere no more. He has Fosco to deal with otherwise. And Fosco stops at nothing. Walter. Yes? The... Admiration that the Count professes for me, it, it's real enough, shamed as I am to admit it. But it won't protect you. No, I realise that. I know the danger I'm in, but I must pursue Count Fosco nonetheless and extract from him whatever is needed to establish Laura's identity. Laura, I take it, does not know that the Count was here. She does not. I have not told her either that her husband is dead. Well... She cannot, should not, be in ignorance of that forever. Spare her all the details, Marion. Break it to her tenderly. But tell her, please. Because the Count knew our address, we decided to move house, and we took up residence in Fulham. We were peaceful and happy enough, and Laura's progress towards recovery was plainly visible. It is a very fine drawing, Laura. Indeed it is. No, it is merely the best that I have managed since I was ill. It is not a good piece of work. I have no illusions, Mr. Drawing Master. Show me what you have done. Uh, oh. You don't like it? 
It is of me. <laughs> well, there must be some merit in it, then, if you can recognise its subject. But I'm afraid I haven't done you justice. You know, Laura, your face has changed. It's become your own once more. The face I saw at Limeridge. You are Laura Fairley again, the Laura of old. And I thank God for it. She has said nothing to me, and yet I see as plainly as you do, Walter, that the situation cannot go on as it is. You and she must come to a decision. Marion, I will be guided by your advice, just as I was before in the garden at Limeridge when you urged me to crush the love I felt for Laura. I shall not say that now. It is strange how, as Laura has got better, relations between her and me have become more and more constrained. I have noticed as much. It's as if we were indeed back at Limeridge. And I was the drawing master, utterly captivated by her, but unable to tell her what I feel. Well, if you cannot tell her, then I must do so for you. That day in the garden, I said there was no hope for you. Let us see if things are changed. Shedding a tear, she kissed my forehead and left the room. My life was at a turning point. I sat and waited a long, breathless interval. Scenes from my days at Limeridge presented themselves. The garden, the summer house, the place above the beach where Laura sat and sketched, and I guided her hand. Walter? Laura entered, alone. Dearest Walter, The answer is yes. We married and were very happy. But the shadow of the Count still lay over us. Clearly it will be helpful in the struggle to come for me to know something about the man and his past life which so far was an impenetrable mystery. I decided, therefore, to seek help from a friend of mine who was Fosco's countryman. I mean, Professor Pesca. Pesca, whose life I had once saved, and who had set me off upon my strange adventure. One evening, I called on him. I took him to the opera. Pesca, I'd like you to take another look at that gentleman, if you would. I told you, my good dear chap, I don't recognize him. Take a look at him nonetheless. Uh, what did you say his name was? Fosco. Count Fosco. Well, I'm afraid I know neither the name nor the man. Uh, why should I? Is he famous? <sighs> he may have changed his name, of course. He may have changed his appearance, too. Yes, in his younger days he may not have been quite so fat. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me... How are you so sure that he would be here tonight? I've been spying on him. Followed him to the box office this morning. Pesca, he's turning this way. Yes. My God! He's looking straight at me, Hartwright. He is. And though you say you don't know him, he certainly knows you. Oh, he stares. Perhaps I'm famous. He doesn't seem very happy. You're right, he doesn't. He's lost some colour. Seeing you, Pesca, has made him thoroughly alarmed. Ah, he's decided to leave. Quick, Pesca, this way. Hurry, Pesca. I think he's escaped us. Yes, the other fellow's disappeared too. Uh, what other fellow? It was a fair-haired man with a scar on his left cheek. Did you not see him? He was sitting near us, and when we were talking about the Count, I noticed that he became most attentive. He looked at you, and then looked at the Count, and when we left, he followed us. My good dear Hartwright... This is all absurdly confusing and mysterious. Can we return for Act Two? No. Back to your lodgings. Please, Pesca, we need to talk. What the deuce am I to do? I don't understand. What is my connection with this man? Well, Pesca, I was hoping that you would tell me that. Listen, 
Today, while I was following Count Fosco around the streets, I was suddenly reminded of a remark that Marion, Laura's sister, made. She called Fosco a spy, by which he meant that he was partial to snooping. He liked to listen at doors. But it occurred to me, what if he were a political spy? What if espionage were his vocation? If nothing else, that might explain why he has stayed on in England, even though the crime against my wife was accomplished some time ago. Hard right, I am not a spy. And as far as I'm aware, there are no spies among my acquaintances. But you are an exile from your country, a political exile. And because of that, I thought to myself, perhaps my good friend Pesca has come across Count Fosco and can give me some information about him. Well, you say I was wrong, but Count Fosco, it seems, has come across you. He is frightened of you, Pesca. Why do you suppose that is? Tell me. Count Fosco has done a great wrong to the woman I love, and I want that wrong redressed. Without your help, that may not be possible. That's right. Dear friend, you won your right of obligation over me on the day that you rescued me from drowning, so now... I put the life you saved back into your hands. And I tell you what should be told to no man. I'm not, in truth, a political exile. I was never persecuted by the government and driven out. I belong to a secret society. That is why I am here. I see. Please, go on. The aim of the society is the destruction of tyranny and the assertion of the rights of the people. I joined it in my younger days on an impulse, and being too zealous, I endangered myself and others in the society. And so I was ordered to England to wait here in case my services were needed. I am waiting still. I wonder, Pesca, what would happen to someone who betrayed the society? He would die no human laws can protect him. Is there any way in which the society's members can be identified? There is a mark which each of us bears. It is branded upon the left arm. I will show you. It is a very small mark, but it lasts for life. <sighs> From the Count's conduct this evening, one might guess perhaps that he too bears this mark upon his arm. One might guess, perhaps, that he has betrayed his comrades and that the betrayal lies heavily upon his soul. Perhaps. Uh, ten o'clock. I must go. And I will tell you where I must go, dear friend. To the Count's place of residence. And now? Yes. If I wait till the morning, he may have fled. Pesca, should I not have returned here by nine o'clock tomorrow morning, you may assume that I have risked all and lost all. I urge you now, for the love that you have borne me, if I do not return, use the power entrusted by the society to which you belong. Use it, I urge you, against my enemy. Use it without mercy and without delay. Within 15 minutes, I was approaching the gate of Count Fosco's house. I rang the doorbell and was at length shown into the sitting room. Bags, boxes, papers and clothes were scattered around. On a table stood a cage in the shape of a pagoda, in which a number of white mice were secured. Amidst this scene stood the Count. Mr. Hartwright. Count Fosco. We know each other by reputation. Yes. I am fortunate, I think, in finding you here tonight. You seem to be on the point of taking a journey. I am. Do you know why? Oh, yes. I know why. I can show you why, if you'd like. All you need do is roll up the sleeve of your left arm. Mr. Hartwright. I assure you, you will see the reason there. Before you came to this house, Mr. Hartwright, did it by any chance occur to you that I am not a man you can trifle with? Count Fosco, I am not here to trifle with you. I am here on a matter of life and death. But whose life and whose death? I would advise you, sir, do not be imprudent. Sir Percival may not have given you much opposition. But you are face to face with Fosco now. Before you think of using that gun, Count Fosco, just wait a moment, please. As you wish. This room is very untidy at present. 
and I'm not certain if I ought to add to the disorder by scattering your brains upon the floor. Well, then, to help you decide on that question, I shall tell you that a friend of mine, an Italian by the name of Pesca, you saw him earlier this evening, do you recall? He knows of my visit here, and he knows what is to be done if I should not survive our encounter. A notice, Mr. Hartwright. I have returned the gun to the drawer. But I haven't locked the drawer, not yet. Your brains may indeed be scattered before the end of the evening. Though I acknowledge they are cleverer brains than I gave you credit for. So, come to the point. What do you want of me? I am here to represent a lady's interests. Uh, My wife's uh, interests. Her name is Laura. Oh, so she's your wife, is she? (laughs) I have two demands. Demands? First, a full confession of the conspiracy that you plotted against her. Second, plain proof of the date on which she left Blackwater Park and travelled to London. Ah, yes, the crucial date. The only weakness, you know, in my grand scheme... It was not my intention that Anne Catherick should die so soon. But her heart disease was beyond even my medical capabilities, I'm afraid. As I say, I require plain proof Sir, that... you shall have it. There is a letter in my possession from the late lamented Percival, in which he writes of the day and hour of Lady Glyde's arrival in London. I'll make a full confession for you, too. But to match your two demands... I have two conditions. First, you will let me and Madame Fosco leave this house. Second, you will remain here in the company of my man of business a full half an hour after we have departed. Well, I accept your conditions. Excellent. Excellent. So, to work. Pens, paper... One of the rarest of intellectual accomplishments, Mr. Hartwright, is the ability to arrange and express one's ideas. I possess it in abundance. Do you? (sighs) He embarked upon the confession. A very full confession, as it transpired, which he wrote with great noise, enthusiasm and rapidity, and in such a large, bold hand that he completed each page in less than two minutes. And as he completed each page, he threw it over his shoulder with his left Mm. hand, while already scratching away at the fresh page with his right. Would you like some coffee, Mr. Hartwright? No, thank you. Oh, you think I'll poison you? You know, the English intellect has one grave deficiency. It is always cautious in the wrong place. At last, the count was finished. (sighs) Done. To my profound satisfaction, the subject is exhausted. The man is not. Eleanor, my angel! So, I shall now sign the document. Isidore Ottavio Baldassare Fosco, Count of the Holy Roman Empire, Knight Grand Cross of the Order of the Brazen Crown. Come in, my sweetest! Perpetual art master of the Rosicrucian Masons of Mesopotamia. Eleanor! This is Mr. Hartwright. Yes, I've heard about you, Mr. Hartwright. Madam? Our guest has been detaining me, I'm afraid. But I am now free to complete my preparations for departure. Perhaps you would like to amuse Mr. Hartwright, my angel, while I do so? I was listening to what you said to my husband a little earlier, Mr. Hartwright. I tell you... If I had been in his place, you would be dead on the hearthrug by now. The packing was completed. Count Fosco's confession and Sir Percival's letter lay safe in my pocket. Madame Fosco got into the cab, along with a cage of precious mice, and Count Fosco held out his hand to me. Mr. Hartwright, I bid you farewell. Do take care of Miss Halcombe. Admirable woman. Take very good care of her, sir. A week later, no more, I travelled up to Limeridge to confront Laura's uncle. Mr. Hartwright, this is all very troublesome. She is not dead, Mr. Fairley. And these documents, I trust, will convince you. 
A confession from Count Fosco, a letter from Sir Percival, which was written on the day of your niece's supposed death, but which announces that her journey to London will be made the following afternoon. I have obtained numerous supporting statements, too. From Marion, from Mrs Mitchelson, the housekeeper at Blackwater Park, from Mr Gilmore. Sir, Laura is not dead. I urge you, therefore, to invite her to Limeridge House and to receive and recognise her publicly. Oh, but, but that would be such a great ordeal for me. It would be a greater ordeal still, Mr Fairley, if the matter were raised in a court of law. A court of law? Heavens, are you trying to hurry me to my grave? Does Laura, if it is Laura, contemplate stopping here, I wonder, after I have publicly acknowledged her? No, sir. Very well. Nor will Marion be stopping here, nor will I. You, sir. Why on earth would you be stopping? Well, Laura and I are married. Married? Married? Yes. I take it that you wish us both your heartiest congratulations. It was not long afterwards that an illustrated paper offered me a commission which required me to spend some time in Paris. Pesca came with me. Since that fateful visit to the opera, he had not recovered his customary cheerfulness, and we both thought that a holiday might raise his spirits. At our hotel on the final morning, as I was about to knock on the door of Pesca's room, the door opened and a man emerged and brushed past me. Oh! I'm sorry, Pesca. Didn't realise you had someone with you. Well, uh, he's gone now. I only caught a glimpse of him, but... Uh... Yes, it was the man you said was sitting near us at the opera. The man with the scar. Did he bring you bad news? Horrible news. Oh, hard right. However hard I try to forget the mistakes of my youth, those mistakes, I think, can never forget me. We had arranged, if you recall, that we would see Notre Dame. I won't go. I'll stay here. And when you return... We'll go straight back to London. I promise. Approaching the cathedral... I passed the terrible dead house of Paris, the morgue, and my attention was caught by some people who had just come from there and were talking about a corpse that they had seen, the corpse of a man of immense size. I entered the morgue. I pressed in with the crowd and moved inch by inch towards the great glass screen that separates the living from the dead. I looked in. There lay Count Fosco, the wound made by a knife or a dagger was over his heart. No other sign of violence was apparent on his body, except upon his left arm, exactly in the place where on Pesca's arm I had seen the branded mark. Over the mark, two deep cuts had been made in the shape of the letter T. Pesca later confirmed what I guessed. T signified traditore. Traitor. Our demons at last had been laid to rest. We lived simply and quietly together, the three of us, I mean, for Laura and I would not be parted from Marion nor she from us. And then in the new year, a fourth member of the family was added and was christened Walter. One final event I must report. Walter? Yes, my dear? Marion and I... And your little namesake here? We have some news to give you. Well? My uncle is dead. Oh, my dearest. I'm, I'm so sorry. He suffered a severe stroke and failed to recover. We received the news from Mr Gilmore. He has asked us to go to Limeridge straight away. Walter... Limeridge House is ours. On the journey north, I thought back over past events. I contemplated the curious chance by which my life had become entwined with the tragic story of Anne Catherick. 
I asked you, sir. Is that the way to London? <sighs> yes, yes it is. Forgive me, I, I was a little startled by your sudden appearance. I've done nothing wrong, sir. You must not be suspicious of me. And now, I am at Limeridge again. I have gathered some flowers from the garden and have brought them to the churchyard. I stand here in the bewitching twilight, and I almost persuade myself that I can see that poor, unfortunate woman kissing the marble cross and beating upon it with her hands. Oh, if only I would die, Mrs. Fairley, and be at rest with you. If only I could be buried here and could wake up by your side when the trumpet sounds. I walk to the cross. I kneel. And I place the flowers. And then I offer a prayer at the grave. The grave that holds the remains both of Laura's mother and of the woman in white. That was the final episode of The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins. Dramatised for radio by Martin Wade. Marion was played by Juliet Aubrey. Laura by Emily Bruni. Walter by Toby Stevens. Count Fosco by Philip Voss. Sir Percival by Jeremy Clyde. And Mr Fairley by Edward Petherbridge. Madame Fosco was Geraldine Fitzgerald. Anne Catherick, Alice Hart. Pesca, Johan Meredith, Mrs. Catherick, Carolyn Pickles, Mrs. Clements, Richenda Carey, Mr. Gilmore, Sean Baker, and the parish clerk, Jonathan Keeble. The music was specially composed by Elizabeth Parker. The Woman in White was directed by Cherry Cookson. <laughs> <laughs>